Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of BrillMedia.co and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today our guest is Curtis Forbes, and Curtis is the founder and CEO of Forbes Music Company. Uh, Curtis uh, is a world-class musician dedicated to sharing his appreciation of music with others through his education. And uh, Forbes Music Company is leading the way in private music education. So Curtis, thank you for being with us today. Tell us about how you came to be uh, a music educator. Uh, Thanks for having me, Robert. Glad to be here. Um, Kind of a circuitous route. Uh, I... um, I originally went to school for engineering and uh, I realized that um, I was much more interested in picking up my guitar than I was <laughs> my textbooks. So um, I, you know, I, I eventually, um, you know, pursued that passion and I went to school for music. Uh, I performed for quite a few years um, and, you know, through a series of events, some unfortunate, uh, some not, uh, I discovered really a passion for teaching. Uh, and, um, you know, long ago I'd, I'd moved to New York city to, um, really pursue that. And, uh, it was, it was life-changing. It was great. Uh, I was performing quite a bit and, uh, eventually, um, I started developing some curriculum for public and private schools in a lot of their after school enrichment programs. Uh, and I was working with a lot of kids doing some music education um, activities. Uh, that's the short story on how I got involved with it. The rest is kind of history from there. It, it was, I felt a little bit more rewarding for me. Um, so some context, uh, my focus was in jazz and, you know, the audiences are not filling up sta- <laughs> filling up stadiums. Um, and I was able to really have, I think, a much broader reach, um, you know, with uh, some incredible audiences. A lot of those audiences were young children that were, you know, inspired by, I think, what, what we could do for them. And now you're now you've been doing Forbes Music Company since uh, 2001. Um, have you been focused on that all this time? I, I see you've touched a number of different companies during that period. Uh, founder, uh, Live Shed Inc., mm-hmm. Brother yeah. Recording Academy, Media Tech Ventures. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell me a little bit about how how the how the how the music education plays into the larger sort of like the the beats of your of your life and your professional career. Oh, what a great question! So, um, since two thousand one, si- since I finished school and since I started uh, performing, and back since I finished school in the nineties and uh, after I was performing, got involved in education, um, I started this organization. And uh, and like I had mentioned previously, we had uh, originally just started developing curriculum for after school uh, enrichment programs. So that eventually grew to, uh, you know, private lessons. Uh, I started hiring instructors. That's really, um, I guess, I guess a, a brief way to describe how the company kind of took off. Um, I think that a lot of the school systems that we were working with around New York City just saw a lot of the value in what we were doing. Parents got wind of everything, and within the community, you know, essentially we hung the sign up, and 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 the phone hadn't stopped ringing since. Um, so, as far as those other organizations, it was really through the course of of developing this organization that I saw a need. Um, or an opportunity really um, for some unique video technology to help deliver. And this was, this was years ago, I think as, as well before any of these online lessons had been normalized, um, you know, pre COVID and all that. Um, So I had uh, worked with some uh, technologists and developers and um, um, well, organizations like that and put together some really savvy, um, clever video technology. Uh, That's what LiveShed was. And it was uh, essentially a a way to give uh, users, to give um, uh, the video users an ability to 
uh, I guess, choose their own angle. It was a multi-camera uh, setup. Um, and so, you know, the, the uses in music were um, limitless, you know. And, you, know and, what, you know, Curtis, what I think is really fascinating about, um, it, I've met a lot of, I met a number of executives in the advertising business, um, people who know how to do selling very well, people who are practitioners, people who understand the art of diplomacy and all these different components that go into making an advertising campaign run. And what I often hear is that the things that they learn in the business, doing some technology component of, of advertising, marketing, building a startup, whatever it is, they often want to take that knowledge and deploy it to the thing that they know and love to do. So my question to you is yeah. with live shed, what are some of the lessons that you may have learned from live shed that can be used or deployed or activated in, in, in music education or what, what, what are the, some of those naturally occurring trends? Well, like uh, in developing that business, one of the first things I realized was my specialty is not video. <laughs> that was, that was actually one of the hardest lessons that I had to learn. And, um, you know, and you're going to learn quickly when you try to develop a business and you're, you know, figuring out that product market fit uh, where there's a major appetite uh, for something like that. And while there was in music, uh, you know, music education does have some limitations in, in terms of your market. Um, sports was also uh, a really, I happen to be a sports fan, which is also helpful. Um, but that happened to be even one of the bigger um, ways that we were able to find some fit there. Some of the lessons that I learned um, and how we can apply it. Um, you know, I was just talking about some, th this. I was just talking about this recently. I think that one of the biggest I learned uh, when I developed that is to really hone in and identify those problems um that you are trying to solve uh before you develop the the solution that you believe is going to work um because i think that at the end of the day we can develop these really nice and fancy features and these beautiful products and if they're not really servicing a need that that we're trying to, that we've identified you're going to have a lot of problems convincing um, you know, it's any kind of user behavior, which is one of the most difficult things that you can do in business. And that was probably how does that take? How, like, how do you, how do you oh, learn yeah. what, what it takes to build a, a process or a service that consumers want? How long does that take? How long um, did it take for you? <laughs> probably the years that I was working on that project. Um, you know, it, Throughout the course of my time building Forbes Music Company, if you are hyper tuned into your customer, and I mean really hyper, everything that we do here is is consumer centric. Everything that we do is client centric, right? F from the technology that we've built uh, to the processes that we employ is all with one goal in mind, and that's to make people's lives better, to make it easier, uh, to make it more productive, and to bring you know to put smiles on people's faces. And if you're that tuned into your customer, uh, it really actually makes the market research uh, even easier. And we did quite a bit of that. And some, for some, some people, it can take years. For some people, it can take months. Uh, we did a lot of market research. We polled a lot of, um, you know, a lot of clients that were working with my organization. Um, I canvassed streets and music stores to test out this technology. So. You know, ultimately, I guess it really depends on how much some experience somebody has in their industry with the problem that they're trying to solve or if they're entirely new to it. Can you tell us about some of the um, the growth milestones that you've experienced with um, Forbes Music Company? Like like what I'm really thinking of, if I, if I could frame that conversation, is, you know, you start a business, it never goes as fast as you'd like it to or never. in a straight line that you'd like it to. No. Nope. Um, like how, if you had to break out the success of your business, what are like three, two or three milestones that are critical for you and as you recall the history of your business? Um, some milestones uh, that um, they would be, well, 
I guess one of the first things uh, that I re- that I remember getting to is the point to to which my the company had grown, uh, where I could not, um, where I needed some sort of of customer relationship management uh, process, procedure, software, something to hold that all together. Um, I think that it, as I be, when I became a business owner, there was so little I really knew about business. My background was not in business. And so a lot of it for those first 10 years was just learning as I went. Um, so reading books, do, you know, um, anything that I could get my hands on uh, to educate myself. And so one of those first things was employing some kind of technology, software, and process for customer relationship management. That was one what, of the big things. And what did you, what was the tool that you used? So, so 10 years, so that puts it at, at about 2011? 2011. Um, yeah, well, I would say over the first 10 years of learning that I didn't know much about is we started using, uh, you know, CRM software, you know, Prob- probably about, I would say, you know, anywhere from 10 to 11 years ago, which is really kind of at its infancy. You know, I remember when it, 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 I started looking into a lot of those things, 2005, six, um, you know, these programs were not nearly as robust as they are now. They didn't have nearly the, the scope, um, you know, that, that, uh, of, of possibilities that you can do with them now. So, there were a lot of, we probably had, we had a system that I had custom built that was, you know, as I like to say, I mean, it was held together by paper clips and chewing gum. Uh, you know, we had a, a custom developed software that we had used to help manage some of our business processes and, and functionality. We eventually then, yeah, I would say probably about 10 years ago, moved to a, a full-blown CRM system. Um, and even just as recently as this last year, migrated to a new platform that uh, has done some amazing things. What do you what do you look at for the success of your business? I mean, it's 2021. Uh, we're, we're barely coming out of, as we're recording this end of March, um, we're coming out of one of the greatest, biggest changes that the world has, our world has seen in the last hundred years. Um, there's a lot of places to go with this, right? You know, I'll, 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 I'll ins- not, maybe not inception you, but I'll, for, for future, like five minutes from now, I want to talk about like how, how you handled COVID and what yeah. that does for your business. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested fundamentally, like what, one of the things I learned recently is that different entrepreneurs have different metrics for how they view the success of their of their business. And those metrics will change over time. Someone who I have a great deal of um, respect for in the, in the marketing and advertising business um, really just, you know, her point of view is like, I want to live my life in a way that's uh, good and easy for me. And that's a good metric. I don't want to have, I don't want to have to work a corporate job. That's, that's <laughs> a metric, right? I'm proud of that. You know, we all have different motivations for why we do what we do. So my question to you really is, what do you look at as success for your business? What are you striving for? And how has that changed over the years? Um, I set out a really long time ago, a really long time ago, Robert, on on a crusade to change the narrative of what it means to be a professional in a profession it is not often characterized by professionalism. Hmm. And anybody who spent time in the music industry knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, there is so much to love about the creative arts and there's also so much to really frustrate you <laughs> about the creative arts and, uh, and the people involved in the industry. Um, I went into the music industry um, because I because I love music and it makes me smile and I enjoy being creative. And I feel that even though I might not be playing music every day um, and making solos or whatever, I'm able to create something else, right? And at the end of the day, I think that I'm in the business of relationships. Um, you know, musicians and music educators have uh, have a stigma. Uh, I think that we work with 
the cream of the crop. And these people are consummate professionals who I admire. And that makes me feel privileged. If I can work in an organization in this industry that is helping people survive and be professionals doing things that they love, that makes me feel really, really good. It's never, never been about a bottom line in this business uh, that I run, but it's always been about making people's lives better. And I think that when we work with children and we give them the tools to be creative and to build their self-esteem and to get better grades, or when we're working with adults who can rekindle or, or discover a love for something new, that can relieve stress and even improve work performance. That's, that's a really amazing thing. And that's pretty rewarding by itself. If I can work with teachers who, you know, who, who play gigs, but otherwise, you know, might not be millionaires, but have this ability to, to maintain this professional practice. And I have provide them all of the tools to make that easy and seamless and turnkey then we're making their lives better too. And that's really my litmus. If I'm doing that, then we're doing the right thing. So do you, do you primarily work with, like, do you have an age range of the, of the types of uh, clients or, or folks that you work with? Yes, a very specific one from yep, ages okay. roughly two and a half to three years old all the way up to 100. You got it. It's everyone. That's <laughs> what, and do you have a, and are, is it like across the board, like any instrument, every instrument, and are you teaching it? Is someone else teaching it? How does this work? Um, it is It is not me. I, I don't teach anymore. Um, I used to. It's been many years since I, since I have, but I don't, unfortunately. I do miss it. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we, do, we do work with all different instruments. You know, the majority of teachers that we work with have, have been with us for years. Uh, we don't have a lot of teacher turnover. Um, we are, we're constantly top grading our staff, um, you know, and, and obviously life changes and some teachers do move on sometimes. And so availability with certain instruments, you know, or certain disciplines um, can vary. Uh, and there might be some times where we, there might be some obscure instruments that we might not necessarily have somebody super skilled uh, on, but that's pretty rare. Uh, we, we have, um, a pretty a pretty talented teaching staff that can just about accommodate al almost anything. And how do you how do you find? I mean, I, I, do you work with people all over the country? We do, uh, we do. As a matter of fact, um, you know, we provide in home music lessons in several regional um, you know areas across the country. The New York State area that includes New York, Connecticut, um, you know, the, the suburban area around the city and New Jersey, uh, the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia, um, as well as uh, parts of the West Coast, uh, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, and, uh, and as recently as last, well, just before COVID uh, as well, um, Fort Worth, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta were some areas of expansion that we had just uh, moved into. As far as online lessons, we do work with everybody all over the country. We even have some international students as well. So yeah, we do. That's great. Um, and as you've, as the world has become much more focused on uh, virtual communication, Zoom, et cetera, how has your business adapted? And were you doing, I presume when we talk about national lessons, we're talking about over Zoom or some other right. you know, Microsoft Teams or something, right? You're not going, right. you know, people all over the country. So how, when did you make that shift? Was it Prior to COVID, was it during mm -hmm. COVID? Let's talk about your COVID, how, how that affected your business. How COVID changed everything. Yeah. yeah. So COVID turned our five-year plan basically into our five-month plan. Um, wow. And the, cha yeah, the changes, the additions have been pretty much welcomed by everybody in our ecosystem. The, the most obvious change, I would say, uh, you know, we deliver significantly more online lessons than we ever had, than we ever had before. Um, what had been more or less a program in beta quickly, I think, just became the normalized method for conducting lessons. How could it not? That was our only option. Um, and we did, I mean, we learned a lot of lessons in those first few months. And, and we quickly established a really strong workflow and a process to elevate that experience to the, I think, the level that we're known for. Um, 
I had mentioned before, we, we migrated to an entirely new platform. We did that late summer. Um, and I think we're providing so much more value to all of our, all of our clients uh, with features that really kind of enhance their learning process. We, we completely revamped our website to better communicate our mission and our services. We turned our business model really on its head to make sure that we have scheduling plan options that could appeal to anyone and everyone uh, across the country, lesson packages, subscription plans that we had never really had before. But the online platform gives us far more flexibility and, and, and latitude um, when it comes to logistics that you don't nece- that you can't necessarily work with with in-home lessons. Yeah, I, I love being at home all day uh, when we work from home and everything we do is remote. I get so much more done, no traffic, don't have to yeah. get to meetings and sit in traffic and, and have the, you know, have lunch and then come back and it's like two hours of the day for one, one conversation. It's certainly valuable to do it in person, but mm-hmm. still nonetheless, it just takes a lot of time. I feel like, you know, one of the things that I think is relevant is that um, I think prior, prior to COVID, you could, people could certainly work from home and do all things, all kinds of remote, but the other end of the conversation, people aren't primed or as receptive to having those conversations virtually. They would demand an in-person meeting and mm-hmm. be like, all right, let's do it. But now the the whole world is so primed for these these communication styles that I think it's it's good on both sides. So I guess I guess my question is you had a five-year plan. So your five-year plan, um, there's a lot to do, right? There's there's supply and demand. There's how do you get how do you get new clients, and how do you staff your client your your existing demand with the right tutor? So how do you right. how do you keep the supply chain, as it were, the human supply chain, keep that in line and in tune with the with with the demand for your services? Um, Carefully, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th- these are some really great questions. I-, I-, I know we only have a limited amount of time to talk about it, or we could be here all night. Um, you're right, car- carefully. E- COVID had changed a lot of things in a lot of people's lives. And a lot of those people were teachers that worked with us and, and clients that worked with us as well. Um, there had been many teachers that had to move on to other opportunities or decided that they didn't want to be involved in music altogether. Those things, those things happen, um, you know, and so we have, well, I mean, we practice a lot of outreach, you know, we're active in a lot of music communities all over the country, um, you know, promote, and we promote a lot of uh, vacancies to make sure that we have a continuous pipeline of applicants that we can vet, you know, our, our vetting processes are um, pretty extensive and really, really uh, thorough. Um one of the nice things about this shift to online, and, and I anticipate some of these things actually changing in the next couple of months even, um, you know, so many of the kids, and I, I would say, you know, a, a, a majority of the clients with whom we work are young, are young people. Um, so many kids were, had school at home, it was all virtual, or they have hybrid uh, schedules where they're uh, in home, at home sometimes, they're in school sometimes. So just the nature of availability made this whole time during COVID, it, it just eased so much of the logistic burden. So whether we downsized with for a, you know our, our existing staff or added teachers, being able to accommodate clients with their requests in terms of scheduling became far easier. And, you know, we, we were almost able to give people infinite options that they could work with in, ter- you know, in terms of their days and times and, um, and not have any sort of, uh, um, you know, con- concessions when it came to the, the type of people that they're having to, that they're having to work with. So it, it's actually been great. Now, I anticipate in the next several months, right, this may be changing a little bit as, as some of the schools are more back to full time in person. Uh, people who are wanting, who you know, if everybody's getting vaccinated, uh, you know, and, and, and being able to invite people into their homes, teachers are getting vaccinated. Um, I would anticipate that there's going to be some more logistical um, challenges that, that present themselves. But we're again, we're, we're making sure that we're constantly we're getting that um, 
that pipeline of, of applications so we can continue to vet people and bring on some incredible folks. Amazing. And how, let's talk about the growth of your business, the scale, how you, how you attract new customers. Tell us some of the, I mean, do you have folks in house that, that do marketing for you? Do you outsource it to folks? Is it, is it a complete DIY uh, uh, practice that you do? Like, tell us about how a business grows and scales in, in your in your industry. The answer is all the but well, not not necessarily the DIY, <laughs> um, but but uh, you know, we do a little bit of everything. We do have some folks in house who. Um, who handle a lot of the marketing, who handle a lot of the social media, um, things like that. Um, we do work with a, a marketing agency, you know, when it comes to uh, a lot of our, a lot of our digital marketing strategies. Um, so it, it's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, paid ads, um, we do, we do a lot of Google search. We do Facebook. Um, we try and stay relevant in just about every channel that you, that you possibly can um you know we have a really unique uh, of business where the individual who is procuring the service isn't necessarily the individual who's paying for it right if the majority of the people with whom you work and clients that you have um are are youth right their parents are the ones right so you're marketing to different types of people and so uh, and in addition to teachers as well, you know, we really do consider them our internal customers and we treat them as such. Um, so we're, we're having to market to a lot of different types of individuals to make sure that we can stay top of mind. How long did it take you to find the right agency? Or, was it, or did you hit it off? Did, did you get, get a good one right off the bat? Um, I think that we got lucky. Yeah. You know what we, I, and which is, which is rare. I mean, we work really, I work, I personally work really well off of referrals. Uh, I, um, I really, really trust a, a lot of the contacts that I have in the business world. A lot of the people that I work with in the technology world, I will always go back to the well. If I have a really great experience with somebody, that's the person I'm going to go to the next time that I need something taken care of. And those people that I trust, if I feel like in their world, they might have um, some connections that can do something, you know, extremely. And the same, the same goes for teachers as well. Those teachers that we work with who are extremely high performers, those are the people that we go straight to when we need referrals of some people who can deliver at a high level like that. Because what you find is that those people who are exceptional professionals, they're going to want to associate themselves with other people who are exceptional professionals, right? You are a combination of those, you know, people that you surround yourself uh, by every day. So um, we were fortunate um, because I just kind of tapped into my network. <laughs> it's always good to have a referral network. It really is. Um, when you when you run ads and you're on Facebook and you're on Google Search. Mm -hmm. Are the ads focused in on getting people to what, what, is, what is the key performance metric, right? Is it like sign up to share your information so that, that you can reach out to them? Is it buy now? Is it, <laughs> you know, get a free, how do people, what's the thought process in your, in your business? No. So <clears throat> that's interesting. And, and, and we've done a lot of testing with some of this language Signing up for music lessons is, uh, it's a, it's a luxury. We know that and we realize it. Um, and people do it when they're ready to make that emotional purchase. Um, buy now is not something that has really resonated with, um, with, with people and it, for our, you know, for the services that we provide. Um, we know that when we have an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody to, to tell them about what we do um, and how much we love what we do and what we can bring to the table, um, that we'll find that we have a much higher rate of success. And so our biggest effort initially is to have a conversation. So um, when it comes to Facebook ads, when it comes to you know Google ads and things like that, it is to you know visit our site and learn a little bit more. Get, if you want to, um, you know, uh, look to if, if you want to more information about booking, you know, 
give us your email, give us a call. And, uh, and that's always our, our first, um, our first touch is to put a place a phone call. It, it's, it's part of that personalized process that I think is separates us just a little bit is the first, the first that we usually make is to, is to, is to make a phone call. Yeah. It's, um, it's building that nurture. It's right. no like and trust, right? Like people need to know who you are. They need to know the services that you offer. They need to ensure that they're going to, there's a like that, they're, that, that's, that, they, that they can trust you. Ultimately. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And we know that not, we know that most people might not answer the phone. They might see an odd number that they're unfamiliar with, but it, I just wanted to leave you a message. I wanted to leave you a message and I wanted to introduce myself and they tell you how we can help. And that's generally what I'll, I'll say to people. If, if I'm the one that's leaving the message and I'll follow that up with a nice email to give them a little bit more information and, and uh, our phone number or in, in, and there have been many times where the relationship is just email after that, but it's still, you know, we still want to make that effort. We want them to be able to put a voice, you know, to the name. It, a lot, I think a lot of, I think there's a lot of opportunity for patience, which I know a lot of marketers don't want to hear. Sometimes it takes yeah. a little bit of time to, to, identify the right recipe that that builds that trust the unique type of trust that you need right. any individual company needs to grow and, their business and don't forget robert people are inviting us into their home to work with their children i mean that's a really 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 big big deal and um in, in fact i know that this is not really in line with the question but one of the biggest factors that that I keep in mind whenever I'm vetting a teacher is, is this somebody that I want to invite into my home to work with my children? Yeah. Um, so building that relationship so they can know a little bit about who we are, what motivates us, those words on our about page, um, we live by every day. So that's incredible. Yeah. And you're really, you're not just selling the brand or the company or the service. You're really selling the, the value and the trust of your teachers and i see on your on your your website you have images of your of your teachers some of your teachers and uh what they teach etc wow yeah and if you i think you know depending on the pages that you're on you know it'll every time you get to that page it'll just refresh with another group of, of teachers so it's always a variety that's populating in those pictures there and so during COVID, does your does your business grow during this time because people are more amenable to online online communication? It, the business has uh, so, sort of <laughs> sort of yes and sort of no, um, which is actually is a pretty good question. Um, there there now there were quite a few, quite a few clients who decided that they wanted to wait it out. Uh, it was important to them to be able to take the time that they needed before they invited, um, you know, teachers back into their home, which is perfectly understandable, uh, who also felt like that an online learning platform wasn't necessarily for them. And that's, that's perfectly okay too. Uh, we, you know, understanding the severity, you know, uh, of the problem, we made sure that everybody knows and knew Anything that you pay for, it's good forever. I understand that this is a complicated time. When you're ready to come back, we will be here for you. Right. Um, and so there, there's there's quite a few quite a few folks who who weren't ready to come back, who didn't want the online experience, who maybe were a little unsure of its efficacy. Right. Um, you know, or if maybe they maybe they had really young children, and I understand that it can be difficult sometimes with young kids who are three, four, five years old. How do you over? How do you overcome that? How do you overcome the uh, the, the fact that you know the new world is online? <laughs> uh, by making sure you have plenty of people who can create the most dynamic experience uh, imaginable, and, and that's that's I I'm being completely honest when I say that. You know, especially for young kids, it really has modified a little bit how you might go about teaching. A lesson and, and teachers have learned i think some have learned the hard way um but the reality is is that you can't do things the same way online as you could do them in person yeah um so in the delivery of the lesson itself uh teachers have to really modify their practice to make sure that it is dynamic and that it is engaging um you know for a lot of those folks uh who 
who um, decided they needed to take some time off and, and wait, they're all filing back in, which is really, really exciting. Um, and then in the time since, it has, you know, the, the demand for online um, has just grown exponentially, and which is, which is great. So I think that the fact that it's been normalized has been something that's really, really helped the business. You know, like I had mentioned to you before, this was a program that we were doing sort of uh, before COVID, but it also really wasn't a normalized practice. You know, you see, you see organizations out there like, um, you know, like Varsity Tutors or, or whatever that provide a service entirely online, um, which is great. And a lot of people were ready for that. But when it came to music and the creative arts, didn't really it didn't really quite get over that hump yet until we were all forced over that hump and then they found out wow this is great i can first of all i can do the lessons whenever i feel like it scheduling is easy i don't have to take my kids anywhere i don't have to invite somebody into my home i can do them from any room you know the scheduling plans and the policies are far more flexible than they are when they're in home so life is better there's there's really no drop off um you know and it's it's, it's proven e efficacy I, t I tell that to just about anybody who asks and um you know i think that in that regard it's been great so we've been able to get a whole new group of clientele that i think might previously not have been ready and so what does the rest of 2021 look like i mean you mentioned that um there are we're we're in the midst of uh changes back to the physical world and there's a lot of uh, unsure stuff happening here um do you what what does the next i guess year look like for you going into 2022 well uh, first of all i think that we're really really excited about um you know continuing this uh this online surge Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we definitely want to keep our thumb on. And uh, I think that that's really important to us to make sure that we dial in uh, so that even that keeps getting even better. Um, and I, and I imagine that it will, um, we're ready to bring on a lot more teachers to satisfy, um, you know, what I anticipate being a really, really strong need for in-home lessons. Um, I think that as more vaccinations happen, uh, as we get closer to summer, maybe potentially even the fall when schools are back in session, um, I think a lot of families are going to be ready for that. And so we just need to be prepared that we have um, some great, 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 great people that we work with. So it's, um, <laughs> you might need to ask me that question at the end of the year so I can answer it a little bit better. But, you know, that's probably the best prognostication. You know, it's, it's like the world right now is so dynamic. There's so many moving uh, parts. There's so much uncertainty. It's to me, it's par for the course for our business. Every three months for the digital advertising and marketing business is basically like, you know, uh, a year or two. We age in dog years in advertising. And uh, so so to me, it's 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 the way things always are. It's it's really fascinating for me to see other industries having to adapt to the, the immense quickness of the change and just needing flexibility everyone needs as, as much flexibility as we can possibly get in every facet of our life because who knows what the world looks like six months from now will there be variants will be we be going outside how will people be in what does consumer behavior look like so when people want to reach out i have your website um scrolling at the bottom here it's forbesmusic.com are there any other things that people should know if they want um a lesson for themselves or their child I mean, we work with the most dynamic and uh, and personable and uh, top tier music educators, you know, who deliver exceptional music education experiences to students, um, awesome. both in home and online. Uh, we also have a lot of online group classes as well, um, which are really, really, really cool. They're at a fraction of the cost of private lessons. Um, and that's another really great option for a lot of people who might not be ready to do private stuff, might want to dive into some really interesting topics. Um, yeah, so a lot of the difference about what we do really lies both in how we're able to deliver, so I think, such a uniquely customized and curated experience for families and also the support resources and mechanisms that we use to provide such an outstanding value and, and, and still remain scalable. So, um, 
come visit our website. Yeah, come uh, <laughs> share with us your info and hopefully we can build something great. Forbesmusic.com, Curtis Forbes, founder and CEO of Forbes Music Company. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Robert. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.